And welcome to the season premiere of Stormwatch. This week's edition features MATC's Mequon campus and just a bit more. Let's get right into it. With Tanner Burke. All right. Thank you for joining us today. This is going to be a little fun, a little fun show we got going on here. Let's begin our look at the Mequon campus with a little bit of a history lesson. And pay attention because there just might be a quiz. And when an individual chooses to go to MATC, the next most important question is, which campus? There are four very different yet similar campuses located in Wisconsin. And today, we're going to take an in-depth look into the Mech One campus, its history, and alumni. A few years ago, a number of the archives were taken to the Ozaki County Historical Society. We currently hold in our archives a number of scrapbooks, photo albums. People can just come, come to the reference desk and we'll be happy to show them. The archives. The view outside the library is so beautiful. This campus was constructed in 1976. Mostly it's the original structure. They just recently did some landscaping around the pond and put a picnic table out there and students are utilizing that. I think it's kind of a, has a calming effect on students, especially during stressful exam times that they can just walk outside and take a walk through the field or go to the pond. And I think that's one of the, the greatest assets to this campus is the, the natural beauty around it. The outside scenery here lets you relax. You can take your lunch break and go outside and sit. The library is gorgeous. That was the last thing that just got completed. The atmosphere is really nice here. The Mequon campus is, it's really great. It's so personable. Everybody here knows everybody here. This is a nice place to work. I graduated MATC in 1972. As a woman back then, most of us did secretarial work. Women typed and did that kind of thing. It's way different than what it used to be. They've got so many divisions and departments now, you couldn't help but get your education here. I mean, everybody is willing to help you do anything you need to do, accomplish anything you need to accomplish. I think I work for the greatest boss there is, and that's Lucia Francis. I couldn't ask for a better place to work. The Mequon campus is also known for its wonderful environment inside and out of the doors. I'm Julia, you're watching Stormwatch, and stay tuned for upcoming clips of next week's Stormwatch. Julia, Patty Peterson's comment about her great boss just happens to be our in-studio guest this week. Lucia Francis, Vice President of the Mequon campus, will join me a bit later in the show. She'll tell us about an exciting expansion of one of the most popular programs at the North Campus. But coming up, our look at MATC in the community features the landscaping class in Mequon assisting a nearby historical house. But first, an in-depth look at the always important the EMT MATC department. The campus, located in Mequon, has a vast selection of important programs for the community ranging from wind energy to nursing. One of the most vital for any community is the EMT program. Greg Leeson, who has been an instructor since the late 80s, has held numerous jobs in different departments. This has given him a wealth of knowledge and experience. I've been uh, in emergency medical services since 1977. I was a paid on call firefighter for the city of Glendale and became an emergency medical technician shortly thereafter. In 1979, I became full-time firefighter for the city of Glendale and shortly after was sent to Milwaukee County to become a paramedic. I was a paramedic for 10, 12 years and was promoted up through the ranks of lieutenant, captain, battalion chief, deputy chief. Now the program is important for students for several different reasons. Uh, one, it fills a need in the community at Ozaki County here. Most of the departments are uh, volunteer or paid on call not full-time in nature, and the communities have a need to have emergency medical services. The students here are more than thrilled to be enrolled in the EMT program. Some seek to pursue this as a career, whereas others simply just want to have this as a crucial set of skills for personal knowledge. I'm uh, studying EMT, EMS program, um, just a part of prerequisite requirement fun, for right? physician right. assistant <laughs> graduate school. They require us to have uh, 
<clears throat> a certain amount of hours of uh, like hands-on experience and EMT is one of the shortest course that gets you to the medical field. It gives you everything you need to know about, I wouldn't say everything, but anything related to uh, medical emergencies in a very uh, like small portion that prepares you if you want to go to medical school or physician assistant, maybe nursing, especially if you want to be like a, an emergency nurse. Leeson explains the process of becoming certified not only to be a practicing EMT, but also a licensed instructor. You have to be a current American Heart Association instructor, trained and certified. Uh, you need to maintain and carry a current state of Wisconsin license at the level that you train at you need to maintain your National Registry of Emergency Medical Technician certification, and then you need to maintain the required certifications for teaching in your area um, subject matter that you teach uh, with the state certifications for teaching. It's not an easy program. It can be very time consuming, which leads to a high turnover rate and also a high dropout rate. Future students that would like to enroll in this program should be well prepared to come to a course that's going to be somewhat difficult and involve a lot of studying. Instructors in this program are actually very good. A lot of them are very experienced, uh, either uh, advanced EMTs, uh, most of them are actually paramedics, and they come with a ton of experience. In case you were wondering what you need in order to get a job after graduating, local firefighter Carlos Velasquez explains the requirements. The requirements for anybody who wanted to apply for the Milwaukee Fire Department where you were supposed to be graduated from high school at that time. Uh, you needed to have a valid driver's license. You had to be over 21 years of age and you had to be a US citizen. Now, the only difference from then and now is that now anybody who would like to apply as a civilian for the Milwaukee Fire Department, they need to have a certification as an emergency medical technician or an EMT and he left us with some great advice that should apply for anyone. Just go for it. Uh, there is always room to have more people in uh, helping others. And uh, besides that, you know, stay healthy, uh, do what you're supposed to do and uh, take care of your body. Say no to drugs, stay in school. MATC's Mequon campus is sometimes referred to as the Hick campus, or even the campus in the middle of nowhere. But today we look into how this campus may be located far from the city, but influences and impacts the community around it. Um, I became aware of the Jonathan Clark House because we had students that had grown up out here that were in contact with Nina Luck. Carol came here and we talked about possibility of the students uh, doing the research study for us. The students were very enthusiastic about this project. They enjoyed the uh, research that they needed to do. They found out many interesting things that, about the things that were Indians and things that were going on in, in this area of Mequon at that time between Mequon, Cedarburg, and Port Washington. So it, it was an exciting project for them. What was included in the designs um, were really two-part. They, um, they gave us their drafting plan as well as a three-ring binder, lots of details. And um, the, the binder supports what they have in their plan. And there's several different sheets of the plan because some of them include different parts of the, um, the property as well as the, the woodland part of the property. This is quite impressive. Um, they have charts for everything, um, including you know what would be planted and what time of the year you would plant it, uh, when it might bloom, how tall it might um, grow to. The students collected the information for this project from by researching online, by researching with historians, and by going to the library and finding books on this uh, subject. All, all of this material they brought together. I believe the students did a lot of research to come up with their plan. This is not the first involvement we've had with the community. Uh, the third semester design class works with the community on various projects. Uh, we have an uh, arboriculture class that goes out and prunes 
in the community. Um, our second year design class this semester is working on a residential site in the community, which we usually don't do. This is a special situation. And then we have a native plant class that does prairie burns for, with a gentleman who has a 20 acre prairie in Mequon. Um, and he does all kinds of work for the community and so we give back to him. It's our first major partnership. Our museum uh, really just got started a year ago when our friends group was formed. So uh, we've got a long ways to go, but I'm sure we'll be working with MATC again. Great community work by the landscaping class. And now I'm joined by Lucia Francis, uh, Vice President of the Mequon Campus. Ms. Francis was the Dean of the Business Division at MATC for three years when she became the Interim Vice President at the North Campus. And she took over as Vice President a year later and has held that position for nearly two and a half years. Uh, Ms. Francis, thank you very much for taking time on your busy schedule to join us today on our season premiere of Stormwatch. It's a pleasure to have you. It's nice to be here. Uh, now, let's get right into it. I, I heard a lot about the popular welding program you have at the Mequon campus, and uh, I hear that you're uh, adding an addition mm -hmm. to the welding program to accommodate how popular it really is. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yes, we are. We're working on that construction now. Um, we're hoping to have it done by the beginning of next semester so students can start working mm -hmm. at their programs. Uh, we hope to get about 30 students, so we're really excited about expansion to that, you know, to add to the student body. And it's a well-needed program. Um, manufacturers need, need folks who are able to do a little beyond welding. They will be doing fabrication, they'll be doing fitting, and um, the kind of work that you would do if you already were a welder. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the idea. Good, yeah. excellent. Yeah. And uh, also, I hear about this new learning commons area that's getting, uh, getting yep. developed right now. Can you it's tell another, us about it's that? An, it's another great initiative at the campus. We're trying that out. We don't really have that set up in the other campuses. So we're trying to see if, in fact, helps the students become more engaged and, as a result of that, become well, successful at completing their goal, whatever that may be, graduation mm -hmm. or just getting some skills. Uh, the idea is to have the library, the students' academic support center, and the accommodations areas in one location one-stop shop, so to speak, mm -hmm. where the student can come and get any help they need to get. Good, so mm -hmm. that's, I'm, I'm assuming that'll be a, a great thing to help the, uh, the graduation rate Absolutely. get even higher than it already is right now. That's yes. excellent. Yes, and it's a beautiful place to be at, Good. too. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, just one, one more question. Uh, what is it that makes Mequon stand out compared to the other campuses we have here at MATC? Well, of course, I'm biased, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, again, it's a smaller campus, so as a result of that, we have smaller classes. Uh, more one-to-one -one with, with the faculty and the students. It's a beautiful setting, so it does help, you know, the aesthetics of it looks, mm -hmm. it's, it's a nice place to be. It's convenient, there's a lot of parking. <laughs> okay. But, but um, it's just uh, the people that work, I think, is what makes a difference in, in sort of uh, the Excellent. relationship they build with their students, so. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Miss Francis, I apologize. <laughs> Still to come, <laughs> we'll head on out to Mamequan Fruit Farm for some mouth-watering apples and some great pumpkins. But first, let's take a look at a student club at the North Campus that's involved with keeping all of that data stored on school computers safe. Technology is constantly evolving, and the world we live in is becoming more and more dependent on that technology. With the world moving into the computer era, the demand for IT security is growing. ISSA, or Information Security Association Student Chapter, is led by Student Chapter President Gustavo Nojosa. I uh, signed up for the professional chapter. I spoke with the president, and uh, he allowed me to start a student chapter. So then I coordinated with my instructor and advisor to start a new student chapter at the Mequon campus. Students wanting to become involved in the professional chapter of ISSA have to pay membership fees to be a member of the ISSA Association. One way that we do this is we volunteer on campus and help raise money for the professional chapter fees. The main purpose of the ISSA organization is to promote management practices that will ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information resources. The goal of the ISSA student chapter is to inform students on new security breaches and threats that are in this world today. ISACA was started in 1969 by a group of people who understood the growing need for a centralized source of information and a need for auditing controls for computer systems. I became involved in the student chapter 
uh, by attending networking events and volunteering with uh, other students and colleagues. ISACA, or ISACA, now simply goes by the acronym because they've broadened their range of IT governance professionals it serves and are not just about audits. One of the primary goals is, is getting the students involved with uh, professional organizations, um, getting them entangled with networking events uh, and functions that would um, uh, make them shine in the community of uh, IT, as well as uh, giving them the opportunity uh, perhaps to um, uh, socialize with professional individuals. Currently our club hosts uh, meetings at our Mequon campus. We also host uh, a Google Plus uh, events where a handful of us um, get to communicate with each other, uh, let us know what's going on in the community. And we also invite individuals to join our professional chapter, uh, which is every month um, at the BMO Harris Learning Center in Brookfield. I was invited to a tournament that the info security team was involved in called Cyber Wars. The MATC Mequon Info Security Team battled against 10 other teams. Both teams would have to defend and attack each other's networks simultaneously until there was one winner standing. If you're interested in IT security or you're looking to join a new club, these are three very active clubs in the MATC community. Fall. A time when leaves begin to change colors, the temperature begins to drop, and the days start to get shorter. It's also a great time to pick fruit. I got a chance to speak to Bob Barthel of Barthel Fruit Farm in Mequon, where he told us about apple picking as well as its history. My great-grandfather homesteaded in 1839. They came over from northern Germany, went to downtown Milwaukee, and they homesteaded here, which was a one-day wagon ride from downtown Milwaukee. He planted the first orchard, had a dairy farm, my father discontinued the dairy farm about the time I was born. I took over the business running the orchard in 1978, so it's been 35 years that I've been running the orchard. In all those years of running the farm, Bob has grown several different varieties of fruit. I grow 20 different kinds of apples. The most popular are Honeycrisp, Golden Delicious, Cortlands, Macintosh, Spartans, Galas, many more. Eight different types of pears, plums, and pumpkins. That is a lot of fruit to look after. Bob doesn't do it alone, as he has several loyal workers that help him get the job done. I have one full-time person on the, on the farm, and everyone else is part-time seasonal. I have semi-retired folks who come in and work helping sales with packing and sorting the apples. My field help are all locals. I don't have any migrants here on the farm. My day consists of grading fruit, getting fruit ready to be graded, picking fruit, hauling fruit. Um, and then helping my picking crew keep going all day long. That is also a lot of responsibility, but nevertheless, the fresh products that Barthel's turn out is always of high quality, which has its advantages over store-bought fruit. Getting fresh from the farm is that you're getting local fruit. It's not transported halfway around the world. We can let it tree ripen so it has full flavor on the apples. The apples actually taste, they're to full maturity so they taste good. A lot of fruit that you buy in the store is picked green, that way they can ship it across the world and until it's sold. Barthel's has had a very successful growing season, with much of their crop being sold to the public. The most popular item here uh, is apples, of course, um, but pumpkins are very popular, Honeycrisp apples are popular, um, cider when we press is very popular as well. The best thing about farming is I get to do all the different jobs. I'm working outside, I love being outside, but I also get to do paperwork, I get to do the desk work, I do the computer work, I drive tractor. So it's, I am my own boss and I, I'm working and living outside. For more information regarding Barthel's fruit farm or their growing season, visit their website at www.barthelfruitfarm.com or give them a call at 262-242-2737. I don't know about you, but I could go for a swig or two of that cider right about now. <laughs> you know, there's still far too much texting while driving going on around the world, and all of the MATC campuses, including Mequon, held a safety event recently that gave students a glimpse of what it's like to crash while texting. Let's take a look. The National Safety Council estimates that 25% of all auto crashes in a given year involve cell phones. Recently, the MATC Mequon campus held an event to help educate students 
about the dangers of texting while driving. The student life office here at MATC at all four campuses felt that this was such an important issue to bring to the students' attention that we sponsored this event. It's hard nowadays because everybody has a cell phone and it's almost ingrained now. It's a, it's a habit. I think it was pretty real. Um, hitting the back of bus does definitely have its realistic reactions. Those little kids. The purpose of the simulator is to show students the dangers of distracted driving, how a cell phone can be the difference between swerving off the road, hitting somebody. Once they try out the simulator, then they sign a pledge that stating that they won't text and drive, they will not exercise that anymore, and then they receive a bracelet that says, will not text and drive. Some of the consequences of distracted driving are a lowered reaction time, a lack of focus on the main task of actually driving a vehicle, and ultimately the, the worst um, result of uh, distracted driving is, is a death, and that's why we have the casket. I think distracted driving is a big problem in our nation and especially for students that have so many other things on their mind. I think students should learn that it takes very little to cause a car accident. Just a few seconds with your eyes off the road could mean death to you or someone else. Take this very seriously. Don't text and drive. So as you can see, this is a possible consequence of distracted driving. So remember, take the pledge. It can wait. Don't text and drive. For Stormwatch, this is Warren Barth. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Warren. Now, to be honest, some of that might have looked like a lot of fun, but again, please, I can't reiterate it enough, do not text while driving. Uh, and in other news, on a lighter note, while well, the Winter Olympics are coming up in February, and we're all getting excited for that, and there's world-class athletic training happening again at the Pettit National Ice Center, one of the two indoor Olympic training facilities in the nation. Stormwatch caught up with Olympic speed skater Trevor Marsicano on the ice. Let's watch it. Trevor Marsicano first moved to Wisconsin in 2008 to pursue his speed skating career where he trains at the Pettit National Ice Center here in Milwaukee, one of the two close rank Olympic training facilities here in America. As I plan to compete at least through this next Olympics and then uh, at that point I'll reassess, you know, like my health, my injuries and you know, I mean, I would like to continue on to the next Olympics, but I you know we'll have to see if the body will allow me to. A uh, typical training day at the Pettit here would be, you know, I wake up in the morning and uh, I'd come here, you know, skate the 9 to 11 o'clock session, you know, pretty much, you know, skate anywhere from an hour to two hours, depending on the workout and the intensity level. And uh, I'll do anywhere from, you know, it's 10 laps if it's like speed work and high intensity work to 50 to 60 laps if it's supposed to be endurance work. Uh, what goes through my mind uh, when I practice is just all the technical elements I need to achieve. I mean, and, uh, and on race day, uh, this might seem kind of goofy, but I try to visualize myself as the Hulk just because, you know, big, powerful, strong, and just kind of something funny to kind of get my mind off of the pressure and everything. In 2004, Trevor suffered a serious leg injury after an accident with a fellow skater. It took Trevor three months before he could skate again and one full year before he regained all of his strength back. What motivates me to skate is, uh, I mean, a lot of people say it's a gold medal, but for me, it's, uh, it's a, the ability to um, build a platform for anti-bullying and anything else. Just kind of, this is like the first stage, hopefully, to something bigger and better and I would like to make a bigger impact than just sport. So I guess that's, that's what motivates me, is just to be able to impact people on a bigger level. Yeah, after the 2010 Olympics, I decided to go around the schools and actually I've been to about 50 schools and do an anti-bullying campaign because that's something that really affected me when I was younger. We also asked Trevor if he had any advice for young aspiring speed skaters. One piece of advice I would give uh, aspiring athletes to be in the Winter Olympics would be to uh, don't underestimate um, don't underestimate hard work because every coach you find is going to tell you to work hard but more importantly don't underestimate smart work you know it's not it's not important that you train yourself into the ground because then you're not going to be able to recover and pop back up I think that's a huge mistake a lot of uh, coaches athletes even myself makes you know almost every year so just remember to train hard but also to train smart and 
keep your mind active and just don't don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure you have other options. You know, whether it be schooling, work, you know, learning, you know, like I try and learn how to play the guitar, just kinda do something different and educational. So just uh, keep your options open. Well, the Hulk seems more like the Flash to me. Trevor wasn't wasting any time taking those laps out there. And you can watch him compete for the gold in February for the United States. And uh, we're just about out of time for this week's episode of Stormwatch. I'd like to thank Miss Lucia Francis, the Vice President of the Mequon Campus, for joining me today. Our theme for next week's Stormwatch is Halloween. And you may not recognize me because I'm thinking about wearing a a little bit of a costume. In addition to some pumpkin carving and special Halloween tasty treats, we'll pay a visit to Wisconsin Fear Grounds for a fun behind the scenes look at some awesome haunted houses. You won't want to miss it. I'm Tanner Burke, forever and always. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.